Uh, welcome again to Atlanta and welcome to day two of the conference. If you were here with us yesterday, I think you would agree there's just one word to describe it, outstanding. Uh, we had some very uh, engaging and thought-provoking discussions that definitely demonstrate our efforts to drive change. Today, we're going to continue those sessions. Uh, but before we do that, we have a very exciting plenary plan for you. Dr. Megan Tripathi, the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology and the Director of OMC, uh, a role that he holds within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, is joining us for a fireside chat to talk about his vision for health IT. Welcome, Dr. Tripathi. And uh, if you want to join me on the stage, you can. I'd like you to. And uh, also joining me today are my colleagues from Regan Street Institute, Dr. Sean Granis, Vice President of Data and Analytics. We heard from him yesterday. And Dr. Brian Dixon, Interim Director for the Center for Biomedical Informatics. Okay, so we're going to have a, a fireside chat with Dr. Trebethi and where he's going to share his vision for health information technology in the U.S. And again, we're very excited that you are here with us today. And rather than read your bio, we thought we would flip the script a bit and ask about your career path in a, to ONC as a director and the national coordinator, because we know that goes through Regan Street. So if you could start with that, that would be great. Um, sure. Well, first off, thanks for the opportunity. Except the year and Boink and Raven Street have been, you know, so fundamentally important to everything we're doing in health IT. So I'm really delighted to be here and admire everything you're doing. And um, you know, I want to thank you for everything you're doing because I know it's a tremendous amount of hard work and it's a tremendous amount of volunteer work. Um, so uh, you know, I very much acknowledge and recognize um, and appreciate receiving this one. Um, so oh boy, career path. Um, <laughs> I took it very circuitous. Uh, career path. Just to get to the bottom line here, I'm probably I am the first national coordinator I think who is not a physician. I'm also not a computer scientist, and I would argue that for where we are, that probably gives me a distinct advantage. Um, not being here with those things. Um, I'm uh, uh, my training is in political science and economics, and um, and I think as all of you um, you know know, a lot of these issues are not really technology issues. They're really about getting business incentives aligned, thinking about our overall healthcare delivery system and healthcare system and how we can sort of motivate the kinds of things that we want to be able to motivate, motivate across a very fragmented uh, healthcare delivery system that has lots of different competing and conflicting um, you know, sort of business incentives, um, which I think has you know, always been you know, the, the challenge for us in um, in the U.S. in um, in healthcare IT, so um, I you know had a long torturous career, not of a uh, linear path. Uh, started off uh, working in the Pentagon actually after um, uh, after I got out of college and graduate school, where I was a presidential management fellow. I was an operations research and analyst um, doing essentially cost effectiveness analysis of weapon systems programs. Um, for any of you who know um, the V twenty two tilt rotor. I spent a lot of time actually doing um, a bunch of work on the cost effectiveness uh, analyses in that program and worked in the Pentagon at the time that uh, the Secretary of Defense's office where I worked actually canceled that program um, and uh, went through a whole cycle of that with the Congress and um, uh, supporting the Secretary's office on, um, on you know, on, on the, all the analyses that you know, sort of backed uh, the reasons for uh, canceling that program. Um, that led to my um, leaving the Pentagon um, as I decided that I wanted to do a different career path. Um, went back to school, got a PhD in political science, where I focused on quantitative methods and economics, uh, primarily political economy, and went, went then to work for the Boston Consulting Group, um, where I did a number of things in the healthcare sector, pharma, life sciences, um, data analytics. Um, but that's what brought me to Indianapolis and Great History. Um, in around 1999, 2000, we um, were hired, we, meaning BCG, were hired by an organization called the Central Indiana Corporate Partnership, um, which I think still exists, right? The CICP and then BioCrossroads is a part of it. Um, they had hired BCG initially to do some work in Indianapolis, looking at the business climate, um, where the idea was, I think that we at BCG had written a 
a report in Massachusetts for the Massachusetts High Tech Council, which looked at areas where you had industry, um, uh, industry, government, and academia collaborating and uh, um, to have synergies in, in local markets. And they had looked at some work that we had done looking at Boston and asked if we could you know, do a similar analysis in Indianapolis. So a team went out to Indianapolis. They came back with eight ideas. Um, one of those ideas was called evidence-based medicine, and it was looking at the work that the Registry Institute had done. And you know, they came back and they said, this looks like an area where the Registry Institute in Indianapolis seemed to have a clear advantage over what's going on you know, across the country. And importantly, it seems like this is an area that's going to take off. Now, I don't know how many of you have worked in consulting firms, but you do a lot of work and usually you're like, eh, we kind of got it right. That was one where it was like, I look back and it's like, wow, that team, I wasn't a part of that team. It's like, wow, they got that one right. They really got that one right. But Health IT, you know, they, they sort of looked at it and said, Health IT is about to take off here. And Reagan Street has, you know, has um, some real assets here that no other um, organization around the country seems to have. The Indianapolis market seems to have you know, a whole bunch of stuff. Anyway, fast forward, CICP came back asked the Boston Consulting Group to develop a business plan for two of those projects. One was a proteomics center, which I wasn't involved in, but the, where I got involved was the project to develop a business plan for what was then called evidence-based medicine, but eventually became IHI, the Indiana Health Information Exchange, where the idea was to create kind of a retail front end for all of the great work that Reagan Street was doing, um, you know, um, under the covers, as it were, um, within the you know within the bowels of the Reagan Street Institute. So I had the privilege and honor of you know being asked to be the first CEO of that um, organization to get it launched, um, working with Sean and Mark Overhage and Clint McDonald and the entire Mount Rushmore um, <laughs> sort of uh, uh, group there. Um, learned a tremendous amount, um, and you know, importantly to me was able to um, convince Mark Overhage finally to uh, to take over um, after we had gotten the company launched um, and were able to uh, demonstrate some success that now John Kansky and the entire team has, you know, taken to new heights. And, you know, so I'm really grateful and um, for that opportunity. Um, couldn't have learned from better people. Um, and that led to, of course, as we started, um, you know, as, as that got launched in Massachusetts, uh, a big effort was starting just, you know, just on the heels of my leaving there. Um, with the Massachusetts Health Collaborative or Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts that put forward a $50 million financial contribution to some kind of experiment in health IT. They're kind of looking at what Reagan Street had been doing, what we were doing at IHI, kind of looking out on the horizon and thinking, you know, there's something about electronic health records here, but we can't seem to move the market. Or, you know, why aren't ambulatory, ambulatory providers buying these systems? Um, and so they decided to launch this effort to, you know, run some pilot projects in Massachusetts. Um, I was sick of flying. I was commuting to Indianapolis for like two and a half years. So uh, that was the opportunity to leave and work in my own backyard. And then, of course, the Meaningful Use Program came, and then we were able to get much more involved with the ones who were national news. Well, thank you for that. That was, it might have been a circuitous path, but the appropriate path. Thank to, you. To, uh, <clears throat> so, for the next question, we've been on this interoperability journey for quite some time, um, particularly since the passing of the High Tech Act. Yet, we've also heard you say, we need to move beyond interoperability. And we know that there's something behind that. So if you could, you know, this, everyone convened in this room here is keenly focused on semantic interoperability, which of course is critically important, yet one of the most challenging levels to achieve. So um, could you share more context of what you mean by we need to move beyond the truck? Sure. Um, so, I mean, first off, obviously, you know, semantic interoperability is really important and is the foundation of, you know, everything we've been doing. But I think we've got, um, you know, a number of industry policy, regulatory, uh, you know, business evolutions that have taken place that, um, you know, that are helping to propel us, I think, to, uh, you know, sort of think about this perhaps in more, you know, broader and more expansive ways, in a ways that are more aligned perhaps with other parts of the economy. So a couple of things that I would point to. One is, you know, we have certainly focused, and I know, you know, all the work at Reagan Street and we've been working on with IHI is, you know, about continuing to push forward with semantic interoperability based on um, open industry standards. And we at ONC will continue to push on that as hard as we can. And you know, that's kind of a rising floor. But I think as we know, right, and I think as, as we keep seeing, the ceiling is rising faster than the floor. 
right? There's more and more information, and that is just a testament to medical science and you know and everything that um, you know that, that all of you are doing and that you know the entire research community, the medical science is doing, as well as the fact that more and more information from other sectors are now being sort of fully embraced as a part of the way that we should think about patients, the way that we should be about individuals. Social determinants of health, you know, however you want to characterize that, um, health-related social needs, all that other information I think we're starting to see is increasingly, is, you know, increasingly um, recognized to be important in thinking about the patient's care. So the point is that that ceiling is going to continue to rise. So we need to sort of take stock of, well, how are we going to address that? Um, because we can't sit around and make an assumption, which, you know, I know no one in this room makes, but, you know, there's, I, I at least hear a lot of what I would call, um, you know, naive, I don't mean that in a deprecatory way, but naive assumption of, well, when are we going to standardize everything? It's like, well, the answer to that is never, literally never. Um, and now, though, we have the advent of um, commodity internet, commodity compute power, commodity storage, cloud native business and technical infrastructure that allows us to say, and of course, AI, AI ML, AI, um, all of those tools that allow us to look at this and say, you know what, maybe there's a whole bunch of stuff that um, we can drive tremendous value from that lives sort of on the top, right? the things that are not standardized yet, um, that we're going to drive tremendous value from using those tools. And we need to bring those to bear um, to be able to do that. The 21st Century Cures Act, um, not intentionally, but in, in, um, uh, in many ways actually drives that further because one of the things the 21st Century Cures Act did with the information blocking provisions that many of you may be familiar with is it said that all information, all electronically accessible information, this is the exact point, electron, all electronically accessible information needs to be made available to any authorized party. Not just patients, people focus on patients, which is great. I mean, we should focus on patients, but all authorized parties, including patients. And what that does is it took the lid off of this idea that we need to just focus on the standardized data and you know and keep focusing on that. Because they basically took the lid off and said, we're talking about all electronically accessible data. It doesn't matter whether it's standardized or not standardized. It doesn't matter whether it's an electronic health record or not an electronic health record. What they're saying is that you know, you hospital, you EHR vendor, you health information network, you have to make it all available if it's electronically accessible, regardless of what form it's in. So that also, opened from a policy perspective, it kind of added momentum to us to this idea that you make that available, whether it's standardized or not, whether it's structured or not, and let the market figure out, let innovation figure out how you're going to drive value from all of that additional information. So that's the first part that I would point to you, just this idea of we're going to make more and more information electronically that's, that's electronic available and allow the market to figure out ways um, to make that valuable. Um, the second point, and this gets to the interoperability versus interactivity, as we think about RESTful APIs, FIRE APIs, um, you know, I mean, healthcare, I think if, if we look at, and I know this was one of Sam Reagan's recent uh, insights early on was, how come so much innovation on, you know, on the uh, you know, sort of computer system side is happening in dishwashers and in other sectors that we don't really see embraced at a ground level in healthcare? And there are lots of good reasons for that. Right? Healthcare really is different in, in fundamental ways. But I think that with the, you know, sort of the um, more ubiquitous availability of API-based technologies, and now with ONC rules requiring that all systems have that available, I think as all of you know, you know, those APIs have a richness to the ways that they allow systems to interact that is different than the conventional ways that we thought about interoperability, which is I send you a CCD, you send me a CCD, we process the information, and then, you know, and that's sort of like a, you know, almost a, you know, it's, it's a very static. Um, whereas APIs allow for much richer type of exchange, which I think of as interactivity. It's systems that interact with each other and that indeed are built with an assumption that they are going to interact with each other. And you know, think about the way Kayak works or the way Expedia works. Right? They don't create a huge data lake of every airline schedule in the world um, and try to update that every single night. Right? They absolutely don't do that. What they do is they have a whole bunch of APIs in the background. And when you go in, you say, I want to fly to Atlanta, I want to fly tomorrow. Those APIs fire off in the background with the assumption that they're going to be able to get that information in real time and then be able to dynamically adjust it, dynamically tailor it to your request. 
that's, I think, how we need to move beyond our thinking about interoperability to say, and just think about the use cases, prior off, you know, quality measures, public health reporting, you think about the ways we do electronic case reporting today, right? I mean, a more modern convention around that, if you just took that Expedia model, would be like, we should not be doing this EICR, RR, you know, um, RCKMS, and then back. And then finally going to, you know, sending you a pile of data that you then say, I need a little bit more information. I better call that practice, right? I mean, we wouldn't do it that way if we're going to start from scratch. And I think that's what we want to be able to get to and say that with an interactive kind of approach, you can have much more dynamic ways of systems interacting with each other um, and being interdependent on each other um, and to, to allow us to automate a lot more than we're able to automate. Today. Yeah, thank you for that, that excellent clarification. Sean, you don't take the next question? You talked a little bit about sort of the, the explosion of data and maybe not necessarily standardizing it. Um, what comes to mind is how AI might play a role in that. So I'm, the question is, how is ONC thinking about incorporating AI into its strategy to achieve its goals? Yeah, I mean, we are focused on, um, you know, two things. One is um, uh, allowing the, you know, the appropriate use of AI and AI and all uh, based tools um, to be used in ways that are going to benefit patients at the end of the day um, and not doing anything that will overstep or stifle that type of innovation. And I think the other thing that the other part of that is how do you sort of create some guardrails for what you might think of as responsible AI? Um, and, you know, that's a, that's a, a real balance to strike, I think, because, you know, we ourselves don't want to be in the business of saying, that is a good AI enabled tool. That is a bad AI enabled tool. You know, we're not regulators and we don't want to be regulators in that sense. I mean, FDA has its regulatory regime related to software as a medical device that, you know, is very well established in industry. They've approved over 500 um, uh, AI based uh, devices that are, you know, either embedded in hardware or genuinely just natively software um, as a medical device. And that's a whole regulatory regime, which, you know, which we obviously respect in that, you know, that FDA covers. From an ONC perspective, <clears throat> what we focused on is more about transparency, is to say that um, we want to remove the black box nature of these tools, at least for where we are in our you know, growing familiarity and growing maturation of this. Because I think we all recognize this is very early. Um, I was struck by, you know, about a month ago, we went and, um, uh, with ARPA H, um, we went out to uh, Microsoft and spent two days out there. And I was personally struck by how um, awestruck they were at what they are discovering every single day. And I'm sure you know you're finding that at Rega Street, but you know that, that that every single day they're discovering new things. And it just struck me how dynamic this is right now, and how early we are in all of this. And particularly in healthcare, it's so much harder to get data, so much harder to aggregate data, and to be able to do the kinds of things that you know they just do with a large language model, just unleashing it on you know on on the internet. Um, but um, so our focus has been much more about saying that increasingly um, these types of tools are drawing their information from electronic health record data are, um, and also the electronic health records that we certify are the vehicle that are used to insert the results of those AI-based tools into workflow, whether it's on an administrative side or a clinical side. Whatever happens with that algorithm and wherever it lives, it turns out that where the rubber ends up meeting a road a lot of times is the insertion of those results into the clinical workflow of electronic health records. And we've, you know, we've focused on that for the last 10 years since meaningful years, right? Spent $35 billion in incentives getting providers to use these electronic health records. So that's a good thing. Um, but we also know that um, there's a tremendous amount of risk of unintended consequences. If those you know aren't don't have some guardrails around them, um, and you know the the easy access to those kinds of tools, I think that you know has been demonstrated with ChatGPT, for example, I think poses an additional challenge and additional danger. And we've also heard a lot from providers about their resistance to the black box nature of it. To say, you know, what, if you can't explain to me why this is getting this result, I would rather just go with the clinical guideline on hand. Because I don't, you know, I'm making clinical decisions here that I'm responsible for. And I'm not liking the idea that you as a developer tell me, I actually don't know. This isn't a causal type of model like that. It's not a regression model. Um, and right, so there's discomfort around that. So what we've done in our regulation, and it's a draft regulation we should um, emphasize, but we're working very hard to get that out, uh, hopefully this calendar year, um, 
as a final rule is we focused on transparency. And so the two things that we have focused on is to say that an electronic health record vendor, and that's you know who we have regulatory authority over, um, Epic, Cerner, Athena Health, all of them, um, that a certified electronic health record vendor um, has two obligations in this um, in our in our draft rule. One is to um, basically make um, available to the customer, and the customer in this case would be the clinical enterprise, um, which are hospital, IU Medical Group. Um, Intermountain Healthcare, whoever that clinical customer is, they have an obligation to make available to them information on what AI-enabled tools are actually embedded in the system, are incorporated in their, in their EHR system. As often it's hidden in the basement of the system and you're not even aware of it. Um, so that's the first obligation. And we have, you know, sort of a complex way of going through that because I think that's all of you appreciate. You know, it's not as if the only way that that happens is as hard-coded um, you know, functionality developed by Epic, right? There's lots of different ways of smart on fire app or interfaces or lots of different ways of having those kinds of tools embedded in the system or available in the system. So we go through a framework that says, if there is some kind of tool that is made available in your system, if you have developed it or you have partnered with someone to basically sell it to the customer, you have an obligation to make available what we're calling sort of a model card representation of what's in there. So what AI enabled tools are in there, we define that we call it a PDSI, predictive decision support intervention. And we say there's 14 types of information that you should make available um, to the customer. And that would be everything from basic performance data, like AUC, other kinds of you know um, data, where your data was trained. So the training data set, um, when it was trained, um, some basic characteristics of the training data so that that clinical enterprise can assess, is that, tool going to be appropriate to my particular context. Um, it was developed at Intermountain Healthcare in Utah. I am now sitting in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and that patient population may have real differences that are relevant to the particular type of you know, intervention that I'm about to think about. So I may actually want to know that's where that, um, that, that's where that came from. Anyway, the idea is to sort of say, here's a representation of 14 types of data that we think we should make available. And we also say that if it's interface to your system, like through a smart on fire app, you're not responsible. You as the HR vendor aren't responsible for going and chasing that data, but you are required to create some kind of functionality so that that third party vendor can make available that type of information as well. So it's available again to the clinical users, um, and then they allows them puts them in a better position to determine whether they, whether that's appropriate to the particular um, clinical study. So again, we're not regulating them; we're just saying that we have a, an obligation toward transparency. Um, and then the second thing we require of those vendors is that they have some type of risk management approach, a formal risk management approach, as they think about the incorporation of these tools. Again, we're not dictating that to them; we're not telling them they have to tell us the results. Meaning. You know, we excluded these five because we think they're too risky. We're not saying you have to do that, but we are saying you have to have a formal approach for how you're addressing this, and you have to make that public available, just as a process, just so everyone knows, you know, Cerner, how are you thinking about this? What kind of process do you do, use to determine which AI-enabled tools you're incorporating in your system? Thank you very much, Brian. Yeah, so we are in Atlanta, um, and so the CDC is just down the street, so I wanted to talk a little bit about public health. You alluded to this in case reporting, but, um, you know, CDC is leading a data modernization initiative, so could you talk a little bit about how ONC is sort of engaging in that process to uh, support uh, modernization of public health data? Sure, yeah, we've... Um... One of the things that um, that we've focused on since um, you know since since we came in with the Biden administration, um, and I'm not, I'm now a long timer in the Biden administration. I was a day one appointee, so I started you know at one minute past noon as the U.S. Constitution <laughs> uh, you know states. Um, uh, so I've been there now for you know coming on almost three years. It'll be you know, January 20th. It'll be three years. Um, and one of the things that we had focused on from day one is you know in a way going back to you know, my experience at the Boston Consulting Group, which was to say that ONC should really be a service agency to our federal agency partners. We should be proactive in reaching out to all of our federal agency partners to say, what are you doing in the area of health IT? Why are you doing, are you doing it that way? <laughs> when we have a whole set of standards instantiated in things like the US core data for interoperability that we require every HR vendor to support, fire APIs, CCDs, those are all things that we require that the industry support 
as providers, you know, certified EHRs now are in 97% of hospitals and 86% of ambulatory practices across the country. So we're trying to make that connection with our federal agency partners to say, you're, you know, you're embarking on a path that isn't really aligned with where the healthcare delivery system is. And ONC and CMS are pushing really hard in this direction. And we'd love to be able to have you leverage what we're doing and align that because and the providers will love you for it. And we'll get much more bang for the buck in terms of the taxpayer dollar. Um, and you'll have more mission effectiveness at the end of the day in your missions. Um, the, uh, the secretary actually instantiated that in policy um, uh, two years ago, put into place a department-wide policy that every federal agency, every HHS agency, that's all he has authority over, is required to, um, in, uh, to uh, include ONC approved standards in every policy and every funding vehicle that they have. And so that's NIH with their research, FDA with real world evidence, CDC with public health, CMS obviously was already doing that uh, because we work in very close partnership with them. Um, but that's, you know, sort of the, just the general context to your question. So with CDC, we've been working, so we're working across the board with our agency partners in a much more engaged way than we get than ONC has in the past, almost as a consulting, a strategy consulting organization internal to, to, to the department. With CDC, we've really rolled up our sleeves and tried to you know, sort of help um, uh, partner with them to think about the data modernization initiative as the opportunity to you know, sort of modernize the interaction with jurisdictions in particular to say, let's leverage everything that we've been doing in the way of standards and the way of interoperability mechanisms, um, use sort of the cloud native sort of approach that the data, that the data modernization initiative is, is, um, is, is embracing and is building upon to say uh, you know a couple of things. One is that we should build a part of that infrastructure to directly support jurisdictions and to um, and that means to um, create a, um, an environment for shared tooling based on all of the standards that we're supporting. So fire-based APIs and fire-based technologies. The ability to do patient matching, for example, at scale across jurisdictions so that different jurisdictions can actually share the same tooling instead of, you know, the approach that they take today, which is each of them living in their own environment, even though they're using federal dollars, but living in their own environments and each of them having to reinvent, um, you know, what they're doing over and over and over again. Um, and doing things like leveraging TEFCO, for example, um, network interoperability to say public health agencies ought to be participating directly in TEFCO. Um, and data standards. So we have an initiative that we call USCDI Plus, and USCDI Plus for Public Health is working with the CDC to say, how do we create a true nationwide public health data model, which we don't have right now, as I think most of you know, um, that is based on the USCDI, which is what's already supported in all of these hospitals and all of these um, ambulatory systems, and then build on top of that, rather than saying, we're gonna invent something new and hope that it overlaps with you know what provider organizations are you know are able to do today, so those are a whole bunch of initiatives that we have with the CDC to you know try to get more and more of that uh, modernization of the platform itself and basing more and more of what they're doing on the standards, both from a data um, uh, data standards as well as interoperability standards and functional standards that are aligned with everything else that um, you know that we're promoting um, across the healthcare delivery system. Um, the last thing that I'll point to is to even further that. One of the things that you know that um, we are working very hard on, I think it's you know it's it, it is public that this is a part of you know sort of um, uh, you know the future rulemaking that we're thinking about um, working hard on right now is the idea of certification of public health IT systems. So right now, eighty six percent of the dollars that are used in jurisdictions come from the federal government. It comes from the CDC. Yet those dollars are distributed with very little set of requirements on how they're used as it relates to technology. And though ONC and CMS require that provider organizations um, use certified electronic health record systems that support standards for things like electronic case reporting, um, syndromic surveillance, or electronic lab reporting, all of those, what we hear from those vendors and those providers is, you know, is ONC, Vicky, what you've done is you've certified the pictures, but you haven't certified the catchers. So we can, yes, we can send out a standard, you know, um, outbound interface um, and, interface, and data for public health reporting and every one of those things. But what we confront is 56 different jurisdictions across the country. Well, it's more than that, way more than that, actually. That's just states and territories, but then you have the cities 
um, and you know penalties and all that. Um, but at least you know fifty six. Um, that uh, each of them has their own little tweak to it. And that means we have to build 56 different approaches and maintain all of them. And that's not just, you know, Epic and Cerner saying that, that's provider organizations like HCA who work across the country in multiple markets. They're saying the same thing. So what we're working on with the close partnership with CDC is to say, well, in the same way that we have said that if you're participating in, in CMS payment programs, you're receiving federal dollars and using those federal dollars to purchase technology, you need to purchase systems that actually um, embrace a certain set of standards and a certain type of functionality. So now we're sort of saying, well, see, well in public health, we should be doing the same thing. Since 86% of those dollars do come from the federal government, taxpayer dollars coming from, from uh, you know, federal government, that they should also have need the same kind of bar. So we're working really hard on, in, on putting and incorporating that as a part of the certification program. And then we'll work with the CDC on how you motivate those jurisdictions to um, narrow the field of what they're choosing to those systems that are certified so that we have much better connection and coupling between those who are sending information and those who are receiving the information. That was a great answer because the take home message for me is we're certifying the pictures, not the catchers. I mean, that summarizes the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> next question is <clears throat> excuse me, we all know <clears throat> that. Um, uh, if we all know, we all know that health equity is a central focus right now, and what role do data standards like play play in that? And what's ONC's role in promoting health equity standards? Yeah, we have a couple of um, things. I mean, first is you know we focused uh, first on data, um, which is to say that uh, we need to be able to you know and I guess you know we've heard over and over from the. Um, you know, from the, the health equity community or, you know, um, experts who we've um, uh, you know, sort of relied on to provide us with guidance um, is, you know, if, um, uh, you know, I always get it backward. Um, if you're not counted, you don't count, um, which is to say that if you're not represented, if various communities are not even represented in the data in any way, then we have no ability to figure out whether there are differences in healthcare delivery in the circumstances of those communities that then even you know forecloses our opportunity to be able to act on those uh, to be able to try to rectify some of the health equities that you know that we know exist in in um, you know in our healthcare delivery system. And what we want to make sure of is that you know minimally health information technology isn't making the problem work. Well, isn't you know um, uh, uh, you know sort of uh, uh, propelling those you know health equities uh, those health inequities, and that it's not making them worse because as we know. Information technology has a way of amplifying things. Sometimes it amplifies really good things. Um, often, as we know, anytime you open the internet any single morning, um, it amplifies really bad things too. And so we want to make sure that from a health equity perspective, that health information technology isn't doing that. So the first thing is we focus on data. So one of the first things that we did when we came in is that US CDI, the US Core Data for Interoperability, we think of as the minimum data set of the healthcare delivery system because it's required to be supported by all of those vendors who are used by the vast majority of provider organizations across the country. And so we looked at that and the first thing that we noticed is there were no, there was no reflection there of the particular types of data that are important from the health equity perspective. And so that was the first thing we did is in the summer of 2021, after coming in, we added four categories of social determinants of health. Um, we added sexual orientation, gender identity, um, race, ethnicity, language was already supported, and that's the, the CDC data set for race, ethnicity, language. Um, so, you know, the most comprehensive data set that we know of um, for represent, representation of race, ethnicity, language, as well as other categories like tribal affiliation, for example, as a way of just saying we need to start to incorporate that as standards that are supported in the, in the community and are supported by electronic health record vendors and therefore can be communicated you know, across the ecosystem. The other part then that we're focusing on, that we're working very hard on is the other side of it, which is what is the type of functionality? For example, you know, we focused a lot on clinical interoperability, um, less so on social service interoperability. Now, in part, that's really hard. I mean, it's much harder because those organizations don't have the technology often. Um, they also live outside of HIPAA, which makes it really hard from a policy perspective. On the other hand, if you were to stand back and say, I really care about health equity, really, really, really care about health equity, we might have invested more earlier on to say we need much more social service integration in the ways we think about interoperability than we have today. 
right? Just to embrace the fact that yes, that's harder. That means we better start earlier to get those things done, right? So we're starting to do more work there and say, how do we think about that? Um, we're working with the department to allow us to have more um, authority in the human services side of the Department of Health and Human Services. And as it relates to standards, we'll have more announce, I think, um, uh, in the next month or so about that. And that'll allow us to start to embrace more data standardization on the human services side that will then hopefully flow down to the market for that better social service integration than um, that we have today. The last thing I would point to is the um, going back to the question about AI. One of the one of the focus areas in our regulation related to AI is health equity. So one of the things that we um, that we point out from a policy perspective in that regulation is our great concern about safety and our great concern about health equity and the unintended consequences from a health equity perspective. And I think many of you may be familiar with the now burgeoning literature of the unintended consequences of just rolling out these systems without regard to health equity consequences. And there's a ton of evidence now that, you know, and again, this isn't, you know, I don't think any of this was intended or the vast majority wasn't intended, but very clear unintended consequences for rolling that out when you have systems that haven't have incorporated a health equity by design sort of mentality. So one of the things that we incorporate in that regulation is, for example, if you have an AI enabled tool that um, is um, a part of the functionality, is to key part of its functionality on um, different types of data, like race, ethnicity, language, for example, we require that that algorithm support the data standards that are in the US CDI. So that, because you may have a tool that, that is in there and that you think is actually, you know, um, stratifying, uh, uh, you know, or taking into account um, differences according to health equity dimensions. But if it's not actually using the data standards that are in the HR, it may actually not even see any of those. So you actually think that it's doing that, the system represents that it's doing that, but it's actually not doing that. You know, okay? So that's one of the things that we've, you know, we've thought hard about um, as we think about, you know, health equity and the implications of it on the other side, meaning once data has already flowed and you're actually a functionality based on it. That's, again, thank you for that answer. Sure, there's another question. This is my wild success question that, I, that I'd like to ask. So in your, uh, you're in your third year now. So when it comes to your eighth year of your leadership here, and- I you, you like me, Sean. <laughs> and you're wildly successful. What does that mean for interoperability? What does that look like? And what does that look like for the healthcare ecosystem? Um, yeah, I mean, it's always hard to you know, sort of pinpoint, um, you know, what would that look like at a particular point in time? And I think, again, as all of us you know, sort of appreciate, we're never done with interoperability, right? And you're always, there's always gonna be two dimensions of it, right? Five years from now, I'm gonna be like, what? You don't have semantic interoperability, genetic information. What the heck is going on? People are already saying that, right? I would ask that if you attended the patient access forum that ONC co sponsored yesterday with CMS, um, the keynote speaker was, um, was a, a man whose child had a genetic condition. That's what got him into help IT, where you know, a number of innovators um, come in through that path. And one of the things he pointed out was EHR vendors don't support standardized representation of genetic information. You know, how come? We're already late. Um, so that's already, you know, sort of burgeoning. So the point is, you know, it's, we're always going to be, um, you know, we're always going to be doing, we're never going to have the sense that, um, that we're done. Um, but from my perspective, I think in, as a general matter, if we can get people to stop talking about interoperability, we'll at least have accomplished a threshold level of capability. So the providers, right? I, I, I hate that providers have to think about, you know, whether it's IHIE or TEFCA, or you know, uh, you know, fire APIs. If you're a provider, you shouldn't have to think about any of those things. You know, in the same way that most other people in other sectors don't think about those things. You just buy a phone. You buy an AT and T phone. You know, it's going to connect with that Verizon phone. You don't think about for a second whether oh, if I buy this AT and T phone, I'm not going to be able to talk to someone on T Mobile. Right? I mean, it's kind of laughable to think about that. There's a lot of hard work behind the scenes that made that experience for us, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, in the same way that I think we want to be able to have interoperability at, you know, at, at like a gut instinctual level to me is providers and patients don't even think about that anymore. The patient can you know, use Mint, they can use Intuit, whatever it is, and have the expectation that I can get my data, I can get my financial data, I can bring it into one place, and I can do that stuff. And they don't even think about the technology. Um, so that's, you know, I think one, you know, core thing. Um, I'd like to be able to, you know, um, uh, say that we're in a position 
where we have a lot more automation of things that um, that are just such vexing industry problems now, like prior off. Just think about prior off for a second. I mean, everyone hates prior off, right? You talk to everyone on the table, they hate it, yet it is still there. Somehow it is still there as this awful process. And if you think about customer service in almost every other sector, they would look at that and be like, oh, wait a minute, I don't understand. You're asking for, does this meet a certain set of rules? Provide those rules back. Let the consumer be able to track the progress of that to see who's responsible for what. And then be able to, you know, administer, adjudicate, and administer a decision in close to near real time. I mean, you know, if we sort of set a focus on that and clear the path to that, and say technology is not the, you know, is not the uh, barrier to that. But you know, so we've got a whole bunch of work that we're doing with the, you know, the um, Da Vinci community on, you know, fire enabling that. CMS and Drawability Rule is now, you know, sort of pushing hard on that. Um, we're doing it from our part from the HR vendors. That would be, you know, one of those very specific things that I think that we can sort of say, even in the next few years, if fire off becomes less and less of an issue, so that it's automated and we can focus more of providers' time on actual clinical care, um, then we will succeed it as well. The last thing I'll point to is, um, and, and I think a core construct of that is, is Tafka, this nationwide network interoperability. We've been working and I've been working, Sean's been working, Rick's Institute's been working, you know, since I think as I described, since 2000, year 2000 on network interoperability. And we had the conception back then of, well, it's going to be every state or region will have its own like iHi. iHi can create a model for, you know, for other places and then we'll connect them all up. As we saw, and this is not, you know, I don't, See this as a failure of you know of, of any of, of anyone and certainly of any of us I should say us because I was very much a part of that. But as we've seen that geography isn't necessarily the right dimension to think about health information exchange. Right? We thought that it was in certain places like Indiana it is. Um, in other places it's really not. Like Massachusetts is a great example. We don't have an HIE of the type that you know the Indiana has. Um, you know in Massachusetts is much good, much more deference to say you know what we want to approach. It from a nationwide perspective and connect with the nationwide approaches. So I think if we can you know, sort of have TEFCA be a way of just saying, that is a way for us to have network level governance across the country that allows the flexibility in places like Indiana to say, I want my local exchange, but allows others to say, I live on Epic, I really want my interoperability to happen through Epic. That's why I want it to happen. And allow that flexibility to allow people to be able to do that. And again, in a way that totally recedes into the background so that you don't have to worry about it in the same way that how many of you here have heard of the organization Nacha? Good, almost none of you. You use it every single day. Nacha is the organization that provides the network governance for ACH transactions between banks. That's how when you use Venmo, when you use your credit card, when you withdraw money from um, an ATM, it is the Nacha network in the background that makes sure that all of that is reconciled bank to bank to bank to bank to bank, right? The fact that you don't know anything about that organization, I would say is a real clear sign of success. Um, that they just do their work <laughs> and then the people who, who make that work, make it work and you don't have to worry about it for a single moment. That's where I'd like to be able to you know, have us um, in a number of years. So that's interact interactivity rather than interactivity. We shouldn't think, I have to think about it. Sean? I'm sorry, Brian. <laughs> sorry. That's all right. Um, so your Nacho comment made me think of NACHA, which is the National Association of City and County Health Officers. And my wife loves that acronym because if you read it otherwise, it's Nacho. So um, yeah, so, but now I have another one I can give her. Uh, but I wanted to um, talk a little bit about um, about fire implementation, specifically bulk fire, since it's now sort of required. Um, and I know that we've been working with Boston Children's Hospital sort of pilot test uh, bulk fire for, for for public health use cases, uh, but we've in our in our sort of first foray ran into some performance issues. So if you want, want to talk a little bit about sort of how you guys are sort of looking at the implementation of bulk fire and um, and how, if anything, um, you're thinking about how to stimulate uh, good performance of, of bulk fire as it is being implemented in, in EHR vendors. Um, yeah, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> so, and, and the reason I say that is, you know, is, is you know, the work that, that you're doing and that Ken Mandel and the Boston Children's Hospital team um, is doing, I mean, we're just starting to see the first, you know, I think the first um, uh, uh, iteration of that. I think there was a, a pre-publication um, uh, you know, sort of note um, that um, was made available, is that we're just starting to learn about what are the issues for 
different in bulk fire and performance um, ends up becoming a big issue. How are these systems going to be performant to be able to accomplish that goal of being able to have you know, a bulk fire API that allows me to get that information in a reasonable amount of time on a roster of patients, not just on you know, one patient at a time. Um, I think that the reason I say I have no idea is because it gets into really complicated space as it relates to um, architectures and the way different vendors have architected their systems. So, you know, for example, just take Epic for a second. I'm not picking on Epic, um, but you know, Epic has a whole bunch of customers who um, I think, as, as all of you know, um, have they they actually host the Epic environment. They actually host Epic within their own environments. Um, Boston Children's Hospital is a great example um, where you know they did with Cerner and now with Epic. I don't know how they're going to do that, um, but you know, but with um, when they in their previous. Um, you know, with uh, uh, they're still on Cerner. I think they're going to be moving to Epic. But you know, with Cerner, for example, they host their EHR and a number of other very large um, you know systems across the country, like Mayo Clinic, for example. They host Epic um, themselves, and so now you say, well, the performance issue, and you know, and, and I think Epic and any technology vendor would say that is that well, now we've got this bulk fire thing, which actually does have a lot of load, places a lot of load on these systems, and. Our problem is, first off, our systems weren't really designed for that necessarily. I need to have a separate reporting environment, reporting database, you know, whatever, however we think about that, that can work offline in parallel to the production system because we can't have the production system burdened by this um, when it's responsible for, you know, for um, real-time um, access for patient care. Um, but we also have the secondary problem that that burden is placed on Mayo Clinic because it's their environment that's getting hit. It's not Epic's environment up in the cloud. So you sort of have this multi-tier problem of you know, these different architectures. Now, Athena Health is a very different situation, right? Athena Health is completely cloud enabled, right? They actually don't allow local implementation. So the bulk fire issues with them may be very different. We were able to put a little more pressure on Athena Health to say, hey, you need to create that environment because we know you can support it for all of your customers. Um, and they are in much different position, I would say, and maybe an easier position in some ways to be able to support that because all their customers they host in their, you know, in their own cloud infrastructure. So I think that's one of the issues that, you know, that it's um, very difficult when you have something that is um, highly heterogeneous in terms of the architecture, the way people have implemented things. And if you try to come in with a regulation, you start to confront these issues of, well, wait a minute, you now placed a burden on provider organizations who may not have the resources to create those performance systems. And if you say, well, you know, Epic, that is now a requirement on you to have X millisecond response or X minute response to that bulk fire request, all you're doing is you're telling them, wow, they really have to re-architect a whole bunch of the way they thought about this. Because when Mayo Clinic says, I'm an Epic customer, Mayo Clinic says, that means I own my own, my own environment. That is an implementation choice I am making. And I have made that explicitly. Now, all of a sudden, you know, it's a more complex conversation between Epic and their customers about how they're going to do that. Again, I'm not just picking on Epic, and every vendor will go through that. Um, so that's one part of it. I think the other thing, as we've seen with Bulk Fire, is there's still, you know, a bunch of that pattern, which I, you know, I support, but a bunch of that pattern, I think, as you as you know, still kind of happens out of it, right? Like the roster, the communication, the, the first thing of how do I communicate a roster? Like, I want data on 1,000 patients, but I need to tell you who are, those a thousand, who are those thousand patients? Right now, that happens. If you just look at the implementation guide, it's basically out of band. It's, uh, I send you a CSV file. I tell you, I, <laughs> I do something, but somehow I communicate that to you. And then the specification picks up with, assume that the host system knows who those thousand patients are. Now, let's proceed. So that's the other you know, scalability issue that we have with bulk fire, which is, you know, just, again, it's not, an insurmountable barrier, but it just means that there's much more work for us to do to figure out how do we actually get that to scale. Thank you. Would you agree with that? I mean, you're deep in the weeds of that. So. Yeah, I mean, my I would agree. We had to have a lot of sort of pre-coordination, you know, bring it back to some semantic <laughs> terminology, uh, some pre-coordination amongst our, our network of pilot sites to figure out um, how we would deliver that um, and, and choose those patients and make that known and, and, and set it all up before they could sort of flip the switch then to automatically query uh, to retrieve those documents. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which is challenging, which will be challenging to do at scale because you won't be able to have health plans do, you know, then, then everyone's trying to do 
that coordination with all of their partners, um, and that's going to take up a lot of human time as well as a lot of compute time. I think the problem is even deeper than that because the requester may not know which patients. Right. If you send a criteria, right? And so you might, yeah. So there's there's right. some deep complexity. So they, they send criteria, but then they get it back and they're like, I, I think there are a lot more patients there that meet these criteria, right? And then you're in this whole back and forth about which a lot of it related to semantic interoperability. Well, why didn't you identify those patients? What's wrong? Is it the algorithm? Is it you know your lack of standardization of data in your system? All of those they use line codes. They use line codes, right? And I will point out that you know. I mean, the tremendous amount of work that all of you have done is fantastic. One of the biggest challenges that we have um, in interoperability, I would argue, um, and I would argue in some ways, the biggest failure of interoperability is not interoperability. And the reason is not because of, the, you know, not, not any fault of any of you in this room, because you're doing the tremendous work to say, here are the standardized data for this. We're going to keep doing, we're going to keep trying to standardize that. But it's more of a system problem because of the dynamics of the industry and the regulatory authority the government has, we have very little leverage over how lab results flow across the system. That's different in many ways. That you know, if you think about prescriptions, for example, sure scripts, and we could argue about you know their issues with the FTC and all that. But sure scripts does provide a mechanism, a market mechanism for um, uh, enforcing standards as it relates to medications. Right? They just do that. It's like if you want to prescribe, you have to use that. Um, and you know, and that's instantiated regulation and issues supporting that, but they're an organization that does that. And then with you know, with things like billing codes, for example, as we know, if you submit a wrong ICD-10 code or a wrong CBT code to support that claim, you're just not going to get paid. So people pay very close attention to that, and there's day-to-day -day enforcement, and in fact, real-time enforcement with labs, nothing, right? Literally almost nothing, no enforcement. If a hospital sends out a local code. Who's going to stop them? No one's going to stop them. No one's in that in that loop day to day to tell them that's actually a non-compliant code. We're not accepting it. We're like, well, you have to accept it because that's all I'm saying. Um, and I'm still going to get paid, and you're still going to get paid. So let's just carry on. Um, so you know, we're working really hard, to, you know, and trying to figure out it's like a ways that we can be creative about you know, trying to do that. But I just want to make that point since we're here yeah. at Moink, and I appreciate all the work you're doing, and we're trying to say is there system wide things that we can do to realize the potential of you know everything that you've been working so hard on. Yeah, that very thank you for that. And that very much aligns with Dr. Eric Schneider's comments about the health the sort of flaws of our healthcare system that haven't allowed us to achieve the quality quality that we'd like to achieve because of sort of the bureaucratic kind of red tape issues. We are out of time. This has been a wonderful discussion. I wish we could have a second, you know, a 2.0, and maybe we'll have, we'll invite you always, back. Always happy to come back. We'd love to have you come back. So thank you very much. Round of applause for Dr. Happy.